Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the California Water Colloquium series. The very first talk we had this year in September was on coastal waters. And now today's talk is on, is from the natural sciences. And we will forget about water as a commodity, all the fight that goes on in water in all over California. Instead, we will simply sit back and smile about how water cost, uh, causes earthquake. And this uh, ability we have to look at water in such a broad context and invite very distinguished people from all branches of human knowledge is enabled by a little bit of money from each of the several deans in this university. And when we add all that money, we are able to conduct this uh, uh, colloquium. We have been able to do it for the last five years. And it is really gives us a wonderful feeling of satisfaction, something we do just for ourselves, just so that we can smile and we can become a little bit more educated. With that introduction, I will ask uh, Linda to come by. She has a quick announcement. Following that, I will introduce the speaker. When Linda is coming here, I just want to mention, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Last meeting, we had some disturbance uh, with cell phones ringing at times. So if you have a cell phone, kindly put it in uh, silent mode. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nari. I just wanted to uh, announce that we have um, just received our new calendars for 2005. This is a project that we've worked on for the last five years with the uh, Transportation Library at UC Berkeley. And each year we have a water and transportation theme. And um, this year, again, it's bridges under construction in the Bay, kind of old and new. Um, we have this really provocative title, it's called Driving the Bay, because <laughs> a lot of people, I think, do s mostly uh, do see the bay from their cars. But we um, sell these for $13, and you can buy them at the Water Archives or at the Transportation Library. And we also have a brochure that you can pick up and you can order them and have them sent to you. So um, they make great gifts. And um, most of the photos are from the archives of the, of the water archives. So I will leave um, a sample calendar over there with the, some of our brochures. And also, I'll leave some of these brochures if you consider ordering one later. Thank you. Now that uh, Linda has brought up the Water Resources Center archives, I might add that this very broad view of water would not have been possible if we were to do it in from any particular college or school. Rather, we are, this entire colloquium is sponsored by a library, an archive. An archive is common to everybody, whether you are in the humanities and social sciences or natural sciences or engineering. So it is kind of uh, fitting that this entire colloquium is uh, being conducted under the sponsorship of Water Resources Center Archives. Now it is my pleasure to introduce <laughs> our speaker of the day, Professor Mark Zoback from Stanford University. He has, uh, his research work consists of two different parts. One is something to earn a living. He has to do a lot of applied work for oil companies and deposits and, and mineral engineers and so forth. But his passion is basic science to understand how the earth works, in particular to understand the structure of the earth, the forces that act on the earth. There are two fields in geology and physics. One is called structural geology and the other is called tectonics. And his work straddles the field called tectonophysics. And he has spent the better part of 30 years, as I know him, to the understanding of faults and earthquakes. He has worked all over the world, but also he has spent a lot of time in California, up and down California, trying to understand faults and earthquakes. What better place to study earthquakes than California? And 
he has played a very major and leading role in this. Right now, we might have heard that a couple of weeks ago, we had this big earthquake, not very big, but a long expected earthquake near Parkfield. And there is a major drilling program goes on there to drill into the San Andreas Fault to understand the actual mechanism. And Mark Zoback is the chief scientist and the prime mover of that project. So that tells all about his uh, standing in the profession and in the science. So I invited him last year to come and talk to us in sort of layman's language to explain to us how earthquakes work and how water plays a role in earthquake. And water plays a role in earthquake in many different ways and hopefully he will address and give us an intuitive feel of the relationship between water and earthquakes. Mark. <clears throat> well, th thank you, Nari. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Berkeley. As I say every time, I've always had a great deal of respect for the University of California at Berkeley, one of the great institutions of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so uh, setting aside all uh, institutional rivalries for the next hour, um, I'll try to pre prevent, present um, a view of the uh, role of water in earthquakes that somehow takes those of you with no technical background um, and teaches you something new. And those of you who are uh, very familiar with this subject and at least casts some new light and uh, shows you some new things that we're uh, trying to do in the uh, uh, SAFOD experiment, which uh, Nari mentioned. I'm going to come back to this uh, very interesting map. Uh, the background colors, in case you're wondering, uh, is heat flow. Now, the relationship between fluids and faulting, uh, I think, first uh, captured public attention um, in the 1960s and 1970s as a result of earthquakes that were associated with fluid injection. Um, on the left is a, a plot from the 1960s showing the injection of contaminated waste at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal near, near Denver and associated seismicity uh, caused by that injection. Not long thereafter, uh, Chevron was using a very high pressure water uh, injected into the um, uh, an oil field at Rangeley, Colorado, in western Colorado, and the water pressure is here, is shown as a function of time, and it was later found that they could actually um, correlate the occurrence of seismicity when a certain uh, pressure threshold was, was exceeded. Now, um, all of this is very easily understandable in terms of Coulomb failure and the effective stress principle. And I'm not going to show a lot of equations, uh, but just, um, just briefly, um, you know, it was actually started uh, hundreds of years ago and, and best studied by Coulomb that uh, s frictional sliding will occur when the ratio of shear to effective normal stress reaches a material property called the coefficient of friction. And the effective normal stress is the difference between the normal stress, in this case for a simple block, related to the weight of the block and the angle uh, at which uh, the plane is, is oriented, and the pore pressure. So if you were to raise the pore pressure, you lower the effective stress, and you increase the ratio of shear to effective stress, and therefore you can take a system that is stable and destabilize it by raising the pore pressure or um, in the uh, natural analog, uh, trigger earthquakes. So this was pretty well known, and this principle was called upon by M. King Hubbard in the 1950s to explain motion on some very low angle thrust faults in the western, western US, and, and it's a, a fairly well understood principle. A little more subtle is the fact that uh, earthquakes are also associated with fluid withdrawal, and there's a variety of ways in which this happens, but one uh, instance that's probably well known to uh, many of you is the fact that fluid withdrawal in the Wilmington oil field in Southern California not only produced a tremendous amount of local subsidence, because the oil field in Long Beach is right on the coast, that was a, a tremendous problem, but also triggered very shallow earthquakes because as 
this region sort of deflated, it transferred stress into the overburden and produced shallow uh, thrust faulting earthquakes. So um, fluids and faulting um, have a, an obvious uh, role in these processes and are um, you know, directly linked and actually provide natural laboratories in which uh, those linkages can be studied. But I really don't want to talk about that. Um, I wanted to start with it, but um, instead I want to talk about fluid in the Earth's crust and natural systems. And I want to start with uh, a, a very short discussion of earthquakes, plate tectonics, and water. And I want to talk about these rigid plates uh, that we're all familiar with, which, um, of course, the lithospheric plates that move across the Earth's surface over long periods of time. And for a long time, I've been interested in intraplate earthquakes. And so I'm going to start with intraplate earthquakes, and then I'm going to start with plate boundary earthquakes. So we can see in this 20-year uh, seismicity snapshot that while the great majority of seismicity is located along the well-known plate boundaries, there are very appreciable numbers of earthquakes occurring in, in plate interiors. The United States, for example, um, East Asia, uh, Western Europe have a, you know, a very large number of earthquakes you know, within, within the plate interiors. And so I've sort of been interested in that and how the stresses in the Earth's crust cause these um, earthquakes to occur. And, and don't worry about the details of this slide, but we can generalize the properties of the Earth's lithosphere, which is about 100 kilometers thick. The, the, these plates that are moving across the Earth's surface are roughly 100 kilometers thick. But only the upper 15, 16, 20 kilometers, depending on the local thermal conditions, are actually brittle and deformed through earthquakes where the lower crust and the upper mantle are deforming ductally, or they're, they're creeping along um, and deform without, without the occurrence of earthquakes. Now, we've been making sort of a, an argument about the mechanics of intraplate crust that um, is, is a little bit too involved to go into here. But the essence of it is that the forces that drive the plates are pretty well known. And because this material is creeping and deforming all the time, it loads the brittle crust. And the only way in which the brittle crust has to fail is through the generation of earthquakes. So that when we actually compare relatively um, seismogenic areas, let's just take China, for example, and relatively stable areas, let's take the Canadian Shield or the Amazonas Shield, it's really not, it's really not the stress level that um, differentiates the area. It's the rate at which earthquakes have to occur to release the deformation resulting from the ther thermally activated creep occurring at lower depth. And what this means is that almost everywhere, the Earth's brittle crust is critically stressed, whether the area appears to be an active area or an inactive area. From a stress and proximity to failure, uh, perspective, those two areas are alike. What differentiates them is the rate at which the seismicity has to occur in order to keep up with the rest of the deformation of the plate. Now, we've tested these hypotheses in deep boreholes because it's only in deep boreholes that we can actually measure the stresses that are you know, causing the earthquakes and the deformation that we observe. And um, you know, little did I think when I took a postdoc um, at the survey um, in 1975, I thought I'd be measuring stresses in about 12 months and go back to the lab and live happily ever after. And I'm almost 30 years behind schedule. Um, so I'm still out there in the field, still trying to measure stress, and still trying to understand the relationship between stress in the Earth and active faulting and active geologic processes in, in different environments. It was very fortuitous to be able to participate in the, uh, the KTB, the Continental Deep Drilling Program of Germany. And we were able to measure a stress profile all the way down to almost eight kilometers depth, actually inject water and induced small earthquakes, and actually test some of these simple hypotheses, which are derived actually from that simple block sliding on a plane uh, diagram that I showed earlier on. And it actually confirmed the validity of Coulomb, failing, uh, Coulomb failure theory, a very simple theory. And it confirmed the validity of this physical property, the coefficient of friction, which is measured in the lab. Now, think about it. We take samples 
from the Earth, and we're talking about 16 kilometer thick uh, brittle crust, you know, thousands of kilometers in extent, geologic faults that have been active or reactivated uh, for periods of millions of years, and we're going to measure friction on a piece of rock that's about one inch in diameter on, in, a, in a pressure vessel under very controlled conditions, and we're going to say that what we're measuring in the lab is, in fact, reflective of how that fault is working in nature. It's kind of a big stretch. It's a stretch in scale. It's a stretch in time. It's a stretch in deformation rate. But it works. Everywhere we have tested this hypothesis, we found that these very simple theories and these very simple laboratory measurements actually seem to describe how faults in situ work. Now, <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, uh, a former graduate student, John Townend, and I were interested and how the fact that the crust is critically stressed relates to its hydraulic properties. And so this is a compilation of different types of data that are shown as a function of depth, and it's basically the bulk permeability, uh, shown over here on the right, of a, of a large interval of the crust, versus the permeability of core samples, which are subjected to pressure and then plotted at the appropriate depth uh, at which the pressure was, was done. And what you can see is that there's about a four order of magnitude shift. In other words, a rock sample have, under pressure has permeabilities over here, 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 20, whereas the faulted crust has permeabilities uh, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16, a rough, roughly four order of magnitude increase in bulk permeability why? Because the crust is faulted, and it's the fluid flow through those faults that are resulting in this large bulk permeability when the matrix of the rock is relatively impermeable. And John and I argued in a paper we published in Geology, which we entitled, How Faulting Keeps the Crust Strong, that basically the reason why we could go to Fenton, we could look at data from Fenton Hill in New Mexico, Cornwall in England, Dixie Valley, Nevada, Cajon Pass near the San Andreas Fault in Southern California, Sweden, and the KTB project, and time after time, we're, we're measuring basically what is expected of a crust that's deforming in accordance with Coulomb theory, in accordance with the laboratory-derived coefficients of friction, and in accordance with hydrostatic pore pressure. That is, the pore pressure at depth is simply due to its, its weight and the column of fluid uh, from the depth to the surface. Dixie Valley was a particularly interesting place, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to discuss it. Dixie Valley is, is one of the um, <clears throat> well-known uh, base in the Basin and Range. It's in central Nevada, where the Stillwater Fault separates the Stillwater Range from, from Dixie Valley. And in work I've been doing with Steve Hickman, um, a colleague at the USGS, what we've been st studying there is a natural geothermal system in which the geothermal uh, system is actually the permeability created by the faulting associated with movement on this normal fault, roughly three kilometers of slip over the last 10 million years. And in fact, water came into this fault zone as a natural system and then went out into a, a permeable basalt at shallower depth. And the exploitation of the geothermal resource is from wells that were drilled into the fault system. And then this hot water, as it came to the surface, flashed to steam and was put through turbine generators. It condensed and then was re-injected. It was a very nice study. And the interesting thing was to, was to watch the, the interplay between the chemical processes. There was a lot of silica deposition, which was trying to close down the permeability, and the mechanical processes, the um, the earthquakes that occurred on this fault, which was creating porosity and creating permeability, um, in determining where and why these geothermal systems uh, arise. They're very rare, and they're very rare because chemistry normally wins. The, the precipitation, in this case of silica, is at a rate faster than the earthquakes can create porosity and keep them open. OK, enough about interplate areas. Let's talk about plate boundaries. Now, you know, when we introduce plate tectonics to beginning geology students, you know, our normal heuristic description is that there are these strong plates that move as relatively intact units with the deformation concentrated along the plate boundaries. Okay? So by sort of definition, 
deformation occurs more easily along the plate boundaries than within the plate interiors. And so the question is, why are plate boundaries weaker than, than the plate interiors, which are you know, deforming, as I've, I've been saying, in accordance with these simple laws and concepts? And um, a number of these questions uh, concerning fluids and faulting along uh, plate boundaries is, is really fundamental to this experiment that Nari mentioned, uh, which is now called SAFOD, the San Andreas Fault Observatory at Depth in which we're trying to test fundamental theories of faulting through scientific drilling. And I'm one of the PIs, and the two co-PIs, uh, Stephen Hickman and, and Bill Ellsworth, are at the USGS. And Earthscope is the main funding agency, and it's a major program of the National Science Foundation. And uh, this particular project is carried out as a collaboration between uh, NSF, the USGS, and the International Continental Drilling Program. The project is being carry out, carried out at Parkfield, and at a point that was carefully chosen after a number of years of uh, consideration of site selection, at the transition between the creeping section of the San Andreas and the lock section, but it's this intermediate section uh, just between the creeping section and the section that broke in the great 1857 Fort Tejona earthquake, this short section of the fault that produces periodic earthquakes every, every several decades and at you know, the point at which uh, an earthquake has been anticipated since the 1980s. Let me just say a word about Earthscope. Um, hopefully you'll be hearing a lot more about it. SAFOD is one of three funded components of Earthscope. The US array, which is several large seismological arrays which are moving across the United States in one case and then they're flexible instruments for detailed studies in another and a backbone array as well. And, and US array is being operated by the, uh, the IRIS consortium in Washington, DC. And the Plate Boundary Observatory, which is 800 permanent GPS instruments and borehole strain meters deployed throughout mostly Western North America, including Alaska and Hawaii. And PBO is uh, carried out by the UNAFCO consortium in, in Boulder. The fourth component of EarthScope um, INSAR has not yet been funded, but we, we all have, have hopes that uh, an INSAR capability will, will, will soon be available. But um, it's been a, a remarkable experience to be, to be part of EarthScope and have these diverse communities all working together uh, and seeking the congressional funding, working with the National Science Foundation. And in 2003, we were successful in getting the first year of a five-year uh, funding program established. Um, just to put it in scale, um, these three components are over $200 million uh, over a five-year period to implement these facilities. They are defined as facilities. So the San Andreas Fault Observatory at Depth got its name. Someone else named it, uh, but it was okay with us. The observatory part was what defined it as as uh, being eligible for facility funding. And the science funding has to come along now to provide scientists the opportunity to work with these uh, facilities. But the, but the funding started in 03. SAFOD is about 10% of the program. US Array is about 50% of the program. Actually, PBO is about 50%, and US Array is about 40% of the, of the program. Now, SAFOD is actually two experiments in one. Um, one experiment is to test these fundamental theories about how earthquakes work. You know, questions that have arisen from a wide variety of studies, um, you know, in laboratories, theoretical studies, observational studies of other earthquakes, um, and uh, have really, uh, you know, prevented progress or constraint of a wide number of, of very reasonable hypotheses, but without which, without direct observations, you know, we, we just don't know what's right and what's wrong. And, and so we want to determine the structure and composition of the fault zone. What is it made out of? Are we studying the right things in the lab? We want to measure the stress, permeability, and pore pressure conditions under which the earthquakes are occurring. And we want to, of course, exhume the material to determine its frictional behavior and um, both physical and chemical deformation mechanisms uh, through laboratory studies. At the same time, we want to build an observatory in the fault zone. We want to, of course, characterize the 3D volume of crust uh, 
that's containing the fault so we understand the geologic conditions under which faulting is occurring. And then we want to monitor strain, pore pressure, temperature, uh, the seismic radiation field associated with earthquake nucleation and rupture. So we have these two parallel sets of objectives. And these, the, the overall experiment and technical plan has um, been derived from about 12 years of talking. Um, the, the kickoff was a, um, a conference at Asilomar in 1992. Um, over 100 people attended that, that meeting. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a great meeting, and that sort of got us going. We started you know, considering site selection. I think at, at Asilomar, we had 19 possible sites. And through a series of meetings, that was reduced to seven. And then I think three, and then eventually Parkfield. And then where at Parkfield would, you know, would we do it and why? We began writing NSF proposals, carrying out geophysical surveys, and, and so on, until in, in 2002, uh, Steve Hickman and I looked at each other. And it's kind of like those two buzzards that are on the, on the telephone pole. And one looks at another and says, I'm tired of waiting. Let's go kill something. Well, in 2002, Earthscope had not been funded. We'd been at it for 10 years. And we got, I'm happy to say, a little bit more than a million dollars from the International Continental Drilling Program to carry out a pilot, a pilot project. And we carried that out. It was very successful in 2002. And then fortuitously, Earthscope was funded in 2003. And SAFOD began um, in June of this year. Now, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go through this. These are some of the questions that have arisen through the discussions with, with these various uh, constituencies of earthquake scientists about the kinds of questions that might be answered through a drilling project that could help you know, establish constraints, move science forward in, in a broad number of areas. But the reason for showing you this was simply to highlight here in this slide all of those questions that somehow involve fluids. And um, the, the weakness of the San Andreas Fault, I'll get to that in a moment. Fluids are, are, one, um, are one possible player in that. What's the fluid pressure within it and adjacent to the fault? And does it change with time? Is, is the change in fluid pressure uh, a player in the seismic cycle? And even what the origin and composition of the fault zone fluids are. Are they meteoric waters that get trapped in the fault at um, um, at depth, and they just sort of stay there, or are they waters derived from other sources? So hypotheses concerning water and earthquakes are pervasive through the science program uh, of CEFOD. Now, the central objective is to directly measure the physical and chemical processes that control deformation and earthquake generation within an active plate bounding fault. So that, so that the driving idea when we picked the site was to be able to drill into an active fault that was continually producing earthquakes so that what we measured was reflective of the active process. We did not study an old dead system and try to derive what that system was like at the time the earthquakes were occurring. Schematically, this is what the project looks like. I'll walk you through the various phases. So we drilled a, a pilot hole to two kilometers depth. We're set off from the San Andreas Fault because it's a complex system of ver near vertical faults. And there's very complicated near surface geology. So we're set off from the fault. We drill down almost two kilometers, bend the hole at about 54 degrees in order to in intersect the shallow earthquakes occurring on the fault on a regular basis. And we'll, we'll zoom in on this in, in just a moment. The background here is um, resistivity, as you can read, from the inversion of um, a continuous magnetotelluric profile across the fault uh, by Martin Unsworth and others. And you can see that the fault zone is associated with, a, with an area of very low resistivity, which is very unusual for rock. Uh, rock is not a very good conductor of, of, of electricity. And these colder colors reflect the expected resistivity for the selenium granites that provide the basement rock on the west side of the fault. So what happens you know, to these rocks? Why, why are they so much more conductive in and near the fault? Does this have anything to do with the uh, earthquake process? As the experimental plan has moved forward over these 12 years, we've 
in, in thinking about how to marry our objectives to do science, our objectives to build an observatory, and what is technically feasible through drilling and, and downhole measurements and installation of, of instruments, we've decided to break the experiment into three distinct phases. So the first phase of the experiment is what we have just completed. In fact, they're demobilizing, they're tearing down. The mast, very symbolically, the mast on the drill rig came down today. Uh, so we just ended what's called phase one. We've got the pilot hole array operating, um, an array of seismometers. We have drilled down and reached a point that is approximately two, almost 2.5 kilometers below the Earth's surface. In fact, this isn't quite, this cartoon is not quite right. It is 2.5 kilometers below the Earth's surface. Uh, ten, you know, we, we publish in meters, but you drill in feet. It's 10,000 feet along the length of the hole. The hole is cased and cemented, and we're aiming for these target earthquakes, which I'll uh, describe in a moment. So, this year, we've, we've built this part of our observatory. We've uh, obtained core samples from here and here. We have a complete suite of geophysical logs. Um, we've deployed a uh, fiber optics laser strain meter here. I'll describe that uh, a little bit more in a moment. And next week, we're going to be deploying a seismometer um, in the bottom of the hole because the exact location of the target earthquakes is what we need to guide the drilling that will be done next summer, which will be then to go out the bottom of this cased and cemented hole and drill directly through the San Andreas Fault to a point on the other side. Now, this kind of drilling makes extensive use of technology that's been developed in the oil and gas industry. And next year, we'll be using a, a technology called LWD, logging while drilling, so that as we're drilling, sensors that are not far behind the bit are actually measuring many of the geophysical properties we're interested in. You know, what makes this project unique is not what we're doing, but where we're doing it. We're, you know, by drilling into an active fault in highly deformed rocks, poor pressure may be high. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. The challenge is really the unknown, and the unknown is, is kind of what the science is all about. What are the conditions in the fault zone? Now, we've, we've run a number of scenarios for considerations of things like wellbore stability, which tells you what mud weights to use, you know, the density of the drilling mud, and things like that. But those, you know, those scenarios have, have quite a bit of latitude because the, you know, these, these conditions are simply, simply unknown. So we're going to rotary drill this, grind up the rock, and wash it out. We, we do a lot of... Uh, a lot of things with the cuttings, gases that come out of the hole in real time, which you'll see in a moment. We'll be doing the logging while drilling. But at, you know, at any time, the, the train could come off the tracks, and we could get stuck in a fault zone. And we have a contingency plan to set an extra string of casing and then try to get all the way through the, through the fault. But after we're through it, we'll, we'll conduct more geophysical measurements to the degree that we're allowed, as well as perforate this casing to conduct permeability tests carry out fluid samples, uh, mini frac tests, and so on. Now, we still don't have our samples of the fault. We don't know what the fault is made out of. And the original uh, idea that we had was to try to core continuously all the way across the fault. And in the late 90s, I was making a presentation uh, of this to some committee in Washington that had a, um, a person from ExxonMobil uh, it was just Exxon at the time, Exxon. And he said, you know, you ought to think about these, this, this new technology in the oil industry called multilaterals. And in multilaterals, you take one well and you make it into several wells by kind of milling a hole in the steel casing and going out the side and starting another hole, um, off the, you know, as, as schematically shown there. Well, you know, when he, here, you know, I'm making a presentation like this to this committee, and now this guy's introducing all this complex stuff, and I, I just thought he was nuts. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's about five hours to get from Washington and San to San Francisco, and by the time the plane landed in San Francisco, I was convinced that he was absolutely right. And so what we're going to do is take a hiatus. I'm going to take the summer of 2006 off. And, uh, I didn't, um, and we're going to use the time between 2005 and 2007 
to decide exactly where core samples would be most valuable. And then in 2007, we're going to come back, cut these holes in the side of the steel casing, and then collect continuous core. These are cylinders of rock exactly where we want them so that when we hand them to the geologist who will study them in the lab, we can characterize the environment that those samples came from um, as thoroughly as, as, as possible from all the information we've obtained from the, from the prior um, stages of the experiment, as well as the fact that we're monitoring the seismicity and we know exactly where the earthquakes are, we know which sections of the fault are seismogenic, which, which sections of the fault are creeping. Now we're building the observatory as we, as we go. So we have the pilot hole and in the spring, we're going to remove the vertical array and install a new, a new device that's being built in Australia right now. It's a combined strain meter, seismometer package, pore pressure sensor. So we'll have the ability to measure strain, tilt, uh, seism seismic instrument here, and pore pressure. So that'll be there. As I said before, um, just last week, Mark Zumberg from uh, UCSD installed a fiber op optics laser strain meter, which is installed behind the casing and cemented in place. So this instrument has the ability to measure strain at the resolution of about 10 to the minus 12. Now it's vertical strain, which is not ideal, but you know, we don't, there's not a lot of instrumentation of this type that's out there and we have to take advantage of, of what's available. And in the spring, we're going to be deploying the first of a trial array of seismometers uh, that we'll actually deploy in this section of the hole. We'll pull them out when we start drilling in, in, in May or early June. And then uh, this time next year, we'll be deploying the seismic, a prototype of the seismic array. So our observatory is built with two retrievable sets of instrumentation and one set that um, is, is permanent. And of course, you know, with time, the instruments will fail, but also with time, better instruments will be invented and we will we'll then uh, upgrade the observatory um, as, as appropriate. So why this site? The site is shown here uh, superimposed on a cross section of the San Andreas Fault. So the San Francisco area is way off to the left. Los Angeles is way off to the right. This is depth. And the colors indicate slip rate. It's the work of uh, Jessica Murray and Paul Siegel. And the red area indicates that below about 15 kilometers, the fault is slipping all the time. It's hot enough that ductile deformation occurs. The creeping section of the fault is beginning to, to creep more and more slowly. So as the colors get cooler, it's indicating that the surface creep rate, the aseismic movement of the fault, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, here uh, on top of the Hayward Fault, um, that the aseismic movement of the near surface is, is slowly decreasing to the point where the fault is completely locked at the surface. And then this big blue patch is the, the zone that's locked at depth, which uh, then produces these periodic or semi-periodic uh, magnitude six earthquakes. Now, in 1934 and 1966, the magnitude six earthquakes nucleated in this area here and were preceded by a foreshock, coincidentally 17 minutes before the main shock in, in both cases. And you know, it's very logical that the earthquake nucleate in this general area. This is slipping and this is locked. So the fault is sort of being loaded from below, but it's also being loaded from the side. This is slipping and this is not, and so the fault is sort of be, being loaded in a way that earthquakes nucleating um, at the north end of this park field segment is a very logical thing to occur. Now our target over here then was, it was nice that we were close to the uh, nucleation point of the expected earthquake, but our goal was really defined by the occurrence of the shallow earthquakes at about three kilometers depth. Drilling costs increase exponentially with depth. So we wanted to be deep enough to get into the earthquakes, that's what the experiment was all about, but no deeper than we had to be. To go, you know, to turn a three kilometer experiment into a five kilometer experiment could easily have doubled the budget. So our target is in fact magnitude two earthquakes that repeat with great regularity at about three kilometers depth. 
Now, uh, these earthquakes have been studied here at Berkeley by Bob Nadeau and, uh, and Tom McEvely before him. And this happens to be a, a plot done by Felix Waldhauser, who's now at Columbia. And it's showing the relative location of these earthquakes. So zero here is at about three kilometers. And what you can see in the, these red circles, these represent magnitude two earthquakes that occur essentially every two years, almost like clockwork. And the seismograms from each of these earthquakes are identical to each other, both in amplitude and in phase. In other words, not only is the earthquake about the same size and in, in the same place, but when you actually consider all of the scattered energy that comes uh, from the, the seismic propagation away from the nucleation point and then eventually is recorded at a seismometer, that's exactly the same time after time. And when you actually you know, mathematically compute where you know, the second earthquake was with respect to the first one and the third one with respect to the second one and the fourth one with respect to the third one, they, 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 they seem to be within about 10 meters of each other. So the target is a patch of the fault, which is about 100 meters across, and moves every two years in a magnitude two earthquake, which would then produce about a half an inch of slip, about a centimeter of slip or so in each of these earthquakes. So we have a natural earthquake machine. And our goal then, so you're looking at the fault. Our goal is, now you're looking in cross section, is to drill across that fault and to study those earthquakes by putting seismometers as close to them as you know, being from one side of this room to another. Okay? Because we, we know they're there, we know they occur with great regularity. Now this adjacent patch is a little bit, you know, less regular, but still remarkably regular. And, and by the way, this is a 20-year experiment. So with a two-year recurrence time, we should have ample opportunity to watch the process of energy accumulation and release over and over again. The green patch of earthquakes is interesting because here you can see they're about 140 meters below the other two. But when you look at them in cross-section, they actually define another strand of the San Andreas Fault system that's 280 meters to the west. So we're actually going to be drilling through this secondary fault, which is active, on our way to the San Andreas. And we'll be actually monitoring the deformation of the casing to determine exactly where this is and so on. But what's indicated by the areas shown in black are the areas of the fault that are creeping, moving, without producing earthquakes. So one of the, the long-standing questions, once the creeping section of the San Andreas was first discovered, um, I think in the mid-1960s, um, you know, the question of why does the fault creep has really never been satisfactorily answered. There's, there's a, a number of hypotheses, but we'll actually be able, for example, to target the earthquake patch with one of these multilaterals and target the creeping section and compare and contrast the composition and conditions um, of the fault where it's creeping versus where it is uh, seismogenic, which is something which, which you know, we've always wanted to do. This is what the site looks like from the air. Um, the San Andreas Fault goes through an area of raised topography known as, as Middle Mountain. And of course, we had to then, from the surface geophysical work, we wanted to be away from the complex faulting in the very near field of the of the fault. We also had to have a site that was accessible, you know, for all the, for the drilling equipment and everything else. And then, and we have to be able to reach these shallow earthquakes. And so after a lot of looking, uh, this site was, was eventually found and we have a 20 year lease uh, for, for the site. Just as a, as a plug, um, there's now two issues of geophysical research letters that came out over the summer with, with um, 20 papers, uh, with the first scientific results from the pilot hole. So um, it, you know, the science is now uh, starting to come out. And so um, following um, phase one, I'm happy to say we, we finished drilling a few days ahead of schedule. We're basically on budget. All of the on-site activities went well. The downhole measurements were successful. The core cuttings, real-time gas sampling was successful. The mini frac was successful, the observatory is proceeding well, and here I am giving a talk about fluids, and it's the only thing we failed to do. <laughs>
when we tried to extract fluids at 4,800 feet, because we were still paying for the drill rig and everything else, we had a limited amount of time, about 24 hours, that we could use to try to get fluids to come into the well, and we could not derive formation fluids over that period of time over the available open hole section. So to remedy that, what we're doing right now is we have an open hole section at the very bottom of the hole, and the last thing we did with the drill pipe when we uh, broke down is we, 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 in driller's jargon, we pulled a wet string. In other words, we pulled lots of water out of the hole. It depressed the water level inside, inside the pipe, and so we have now six months for formation fluid to come in, and we tagged the fluid that was used for drilling with fluorescent dyes, rhodamine and fluorescine, so that we know exactly what the composition of the drilling fluid was, and we can then distinguish the formation fluid. So the first thing we'll do uh, when we start up again is actually extract that fluid from the bottom of the hole and hopefully uh, make up for the, the one, uh, one piece of critical data that we did not get uh, this summer. Just a couple more points about, about fluids. Um, anybody knows anything about drilling oil wells, one of the things you worry a lot about is hitting gas. It's very dangerous. You could have a blowout. If you hit H2S, it's very poisonous. And so part of what you monitor when you're drilling an oil well is the gas that's coming out for safety reasons. Well, we were working with a, with a group from the um, University of Potsdam and um, Geoforschungszentrum uh, Research Institute in Potsdam that actually sort of took this to the next level. We separated the gas from the drilling mud as soon as it came to the surface and put it into a, a gas chromatograph, a mass spectrometer, and a radon detector, and then we actually even took, took samples of this gas so it can be taken to a better uh, mass spec uh, back in the lab. And so we have a continuous profile of gases that were coming out as we were drilling. And this is um, a plot from the, from the pilot hole, 2.2 kilometers deep, and you can see the variation of helium, methane, radon, and CO2, and the gray bars indicate major shear zones. This granite was all faulted up, but in the, in the major shear zones, there were distinct anomalies of, natural of different types of gas coming out, and so these gases of different origins are flowing out along these major fault zones, and, and what role they may play um, in the Earthquake process is something that's long been speculated about, and I'll get to that in a minute. We're doing the same thing in the, um, in the main hole, and this is just some of the, some of the data that's, um, you know, very, we don't have the lower section of the data processed yet, but it's been a very, very successful part of, part of the experiment. Now, that's all the what we're doing. Now let me tell you a little bit more about the why that we're doing it. And, this is a, I, I learned about this as a, as a graduate student, um, listening to a talk given by a very distinguished scientist by the name of Art Lockenbrook. And in geophysics, up until that point, I'd been taught to learn how to try to explain anomalies. You go out and measure the gravity field and you see a bump, and you try to figure out what's causing the anomaly, or, or the magnetic field, or resistivity, or, or seismic velocities, you know, but seismic velocities are refracting or reflecting off of something. Something's changed in the subsurface. And here's this very distinguished scientist trying to explain what he is not seeing. And it took me quite a while to appreciate, you know, what it was he was driving at. And, and it, it comes down to a very simple principle. If those laws for the deformation of faults that I described before that seem to work so well in the continents are also applicable to the San Andreas Fault, then the San Andreas Fault should be generating heat. And it's no more complicated than rubbing your hands together. If you rub them fast and you push hard, your hands get warm. And um, Art and his colleagues and, and um, uh, scientists at Caltech before them had started to measure heat coming out of the Earth through heat flow measurements in relatively shallow holes along the San Andreas and they never found this frictional heat. It was gone. It wasn't there. Now, there were two ways of explaining this. We knew the fault, how, we knew how fast the fault was moving. That's known geologically and consistent with what we know from plate tectonics. So there's no doubting the velocity of the fault. And so one hypothesis was that, in fact, the fault 
was slipping at much lower stress levels. So it's like rubbing your hands together, but not pushing them together very hard. They don't, they don't get warm. The other hypothesis is that the heat flow data were just meaningless. And they were meaningless. After all, they were inconsistent with our preconceived notions. So that, that made them suspect immediately. But they were meaningless because the holes were relatively shallow. And there was the possibility that groundwater flow could simply take the heat generated by the friction on the San Andreas Fault and distribute it over a broad area, and you'd never see it. So there these two ideas. The fault was weak and not generating heat, which meant something very profound about the laws describing the faulting, or that the heat flow measurements just weren't very reliable because they're made at relatively shallow depth, and there were sources of noise that would um, obscure any signal. So basically, um, in a very s simple and schematic way, the hypothesis is that if this Coulomb failure process is correct, then earthquakes sort of represent the increase in shear stress and the drop in shear stress in an earthquake. And over time, shear stress increases again and drops again and so on. Whereas if the fault really is deforming under low stress levels, it's the exact same picture but it's all occurring at much lower stress levels. And seismology and geodesy can define how much the stress changes in a given earthquake, but they could not define the absolute level over which the process was occurring. So if the heat flow data were reliable, it implies that something was dramatically lowering the frictional strength of the fault. And there were three ways of accomplishing that. Maybe what we were studying in the lab was really not very indicative of, of the San Andreas Fault. It's fine for the faults you know, within plates. But after all, the San Andreas Fault has moved hundreds of kilometers. There have been tens of thousands of Parkfield earthquakes before us. And that over time, that intense deformation and the chemical alteration of the rock associated with that deformation changed it so profoundly that the intrinsic friction was you know, a factor of 6 to 10 lower of the actual fault than what we measure in the laboratory. Okay? We're just measuring the wrong thing in the laboratory. We're looking at the wrong materials. The second class of hypotheses have to do with pore pressure. Remember, if we could raise the pore pressure and cause that unstable, that's, that block to slide down the plane or trigger earthquakes in oil fields, if the pore pressure is very high, faulting could occur at a low level of shear stress. And the third is a variety of dynamic weakening mechanisms that say, as the fault begins to rupture and propagate in an earthquake, something happens. That something could be shear heating. You start to generate frictional heat. That heat causes the water to heat up. When the water heats up, it begins to expand. And that expansion increases the pressure. Another hypothesis is melting. Another hypothesis is that the seismic waves, as the earthquake begin, get trapped in the fault zone and actually push apart the planes of the fault and make faulting more easy to happen. But this is all dependent on the validity of the heat flow measurements, implying that the fault was weak. And so in the late 1980s, we drilled a deep well um, in Cajon Pass in, in Southern California. And this is heat flow as a function of position with respect to the San Andreas Fault. So the regional heat flow is about 70 milliwatts per meter square. This is why the temperature increases in the Earth at about 30 degrees per kilometer with depth. And if the San Andreas were generating heat due to this expected friction, superimposed on sort of the regional picture would be an anomaly that looks something like the green one. Now, the, all the blue dots are those shallow measurements, which were so suspect that showed no anomaly. Well, at Cajon Pass, we drilled to 3 and a half kilometers, and we measured heat flow. And what did we get? We got exactly what we got in all of the shallow measurements. Our first indication from a deep measurement that, in fact, the heat was not being generated. In the pilot hole, the heat flow is in, the, in, the, in this area is a little bit more complicated. It's high in the coast ranges and low in the uh, in Central Valley. But the pilot hole heat flow measurements made by Colin Williams at the USGS indicate that, in fact, 
the heat flow at depth, at two kilometers depth, is the same as indicated by the shallow measurements, and there's no indication of the expected increase in, in heat. So it really does look as if the fault is slipping at low shear stress. When you look at the orientation of the forces in the crust adjacent to the San Andreas, everywhere we look, we see that the direction of maximum compression, indicated by these arrows, is at a very high angle to the San Andreas Fault. This means that if we had a box on the floor, floor, the box is sliding even though we're pushing straight down on it. And the only way you know, that's explainable is if there were extremely low friction, like you, you, know, you emptied a can of motor oil on the floor before you did your experiment. And so after the heat flow data came the stress orientation data, which simply seemed to say the same thing, that somehow the laws governing faults within plates are being violated by these great plate bounding faults, which have had so much more deformation and so much greater slip. And so this turns on the hypothesis machine. Okay, Why is that? And the hypotheses then fall into those three categories. Low friction, what might be in the fault, high fluid pressure, or dynamic mechanisms. So here are just several of the high fluid pressure measurements, uh, hypotheses. There are no measurements yet. Um, one is that the fault is a leaky conduit, and fluids are coming from the deep mantle, uh, the deep crust or the upper mantle along the fault, and then leaking out into the adjacent crust. And it's these high pressure fluids coming from great depth that are making, th that is making the uh, average shear stress on the fault lower. In this case, it's argued that the fault is, is actually isolated from the surrounding medium by impermeable boundaries associated with deformation, and so that the fault core has high fluid pressure, whereas the adjacent crust does not. In this hypothesis, um, the fluid pressure actually changes with time, say due to a creep compaction mechanism. This is all crushed up, and if it's slowly compacting with time, the fluid pressure will increase and then be released in an earthquake. I'll show you that in a bit more detail in a moment. And, and there are variations of, of those kinds of hypotheses. So once we start to you know, think about fluids, we can, we can call upon them in a, in a variety of ways. And so you know, the creep compaction um, hypothesis would argue that during the interseismic period, Compaction is reducing the porosity. The fluid pressure is going up. And then eventually, when an earthquake occurs, you sort of reset the system. The earthquake breaks up everything. You, you get an increase in porosity, and the fluid pressure drops. And so what this is saying is that the exact nucleation time of the earthquake is controlled by two processes, the increase of fluid pressure, which is decreasing the strength, and the increase in shear stress due to the continued plate motion. Very reasonable, but we have no idea about whether it's right or not. Is the fault a leaky conduit for fluids from the deep mantle, uh, from the deep crust or, or upper mantle? Well, uh, Mac Kennedy here at LBL and Don DiPaolo and Yusuf Karaka at the USGS a few years ago demonstrated that the helium isotopes seem to show a big anomaly in indicating a mantle origin for fluids along the San Andreas system. But what we don't know yet is whether this anomaly results from simply the leaking of mantle gases from very great depth, because the crust is all broken up, it's simply easier to escape, or is somehow intimately associated with what's happening inside the fault zone and the earthquake process. There are a number of chemical uh, roles of fluid, which I'm not going not to get into, but looking at you know, other faults, exhumed faults, and laboratory measurements, um, we'll have the opportunity to calibrate and compare what we see in the cores that we obtain with those obtained in, in other geologic environments and be able to test the role of chemical processes in the seismic process. Um, I'm going to just skip over this uh, in the interest of time, but I, if you recall, I said we were going to be perforating the casing and making pressure and uh, other measurements as a function of position, and there are 
published hypotheses that indicate, you know, shown schematically here, of course, how pore pressure should be increasing as we get into the core of the fault. Um, if it's the high pore pressure hypothesis, or if it's the low friction hypothesis, we should see low friction in the core samples and more or less normal pore pressure when we measure it. Uh, some of the dynamic weakening mechanisms require very specific rock properties. As the material begins to heat up as you shear it, if it's very permeable, that fluid just sort of, you know, the fluid pressure doesn't build up because you, you generate the heat, but it's so permeable that the pressure just dissipates. In this calculation done by my colleague uh, Paul Siegel and Jim Rice, the strength dramatically decreases. It's a dynamic weakening mechanism, but it requires very specific physical properties um, in, order to, in order to work. And um, when we look at exhumed faults, permeability, for example, goes all over the place. And these are, this is a fault that's long dead, and we just don't know how to interpret this highly variable permeability in terms of real faults that are actually moving now. But we'll have the opportunity to do that by me making measurements on the core samples. So to conclude, uh, September 8th, 28th, 2005, we, we will have drilled through the fault. We will have not have done these multilaterals. We will have installed this array, and we would have put the pilot hole instrument here, and we will continue to have our laser strain meter. Unfortunately, on September 28th, oh, oh I blew it. This is supposed to be 2004. We had a bit of an abrupt surprise, and that was the long-expected Parkfield earthquake. As some of you know quite well, the unusual thing about this earthquake is that it nucleated not where it was expected over here and propagated to the south, but in fact nucleated at the southern end of the rupture zone and propagated to the north. So the Parkfield earthquake has occurred, but you know, frankly, it's okay with me. We're, our magnitude two earthquakes have actually speeded up and they'll eventually die down to the, the background rate and our experiment is, is, is intact, okay? Um, so, to conclude where we are now, you know, the main shock and aftershocks caused no problem. They were recorded on the pilot hole array, which is very nice. And in fact, we'll start phase two in May of 2005 with a fluid sampling test to make up for what we don't have and to begin the process of testing these various hypotheses. So, um, just to, just one word in conclusion then is, you know, we've known for a long time about the relationship between fluids and faulting. But what we don't know is how far those relationships go and how profound they are. And whether when we call on fluid pressure, you know, we're, we're doing so because it is what really is important inside the fault zone, or whether it's just, you know, a convenient um, way of explaining what we don't understand. And that is, in this, in this particular case, the low shear stress at which faulting seems to occur. And so while we, we've learned a lot and we're in the middle of a big experiment, I think these questions about fluids and faulting are going to continue to arise and, and fascinate us for, for, for a long time to come. So thank you very much. You know, um, I've been at Stanford for 20 years, and before then, I was sort of a branch chief at the USGS, um, in which every one of these things uh, caused me great concern, and we had to do all the work to kind of test them out. One of the great things about leaving the USGS, in fact, the only great thing, USGS is a great organization, was once I went to Stanford, I didn't have to do that anymore, you know. The problem is, you know, they're non-scientific observations. An earthquake occurs and yesterday someone noticed that their dog, horse, cat, or cockroach acted unusual. And every controlled experiment has been a failure. So whether there's something there or not is, is really unknown. All we know is that when controlled experiments are, are attempted, nothing is observed. But it's very hard to do a controlled experiment because you don't know where the earthquakes are going to be. You don't, you know, know what systems. Are. So it's the kind of thing that keeps coming up, and and um, it's hard to take seriously. It's hard to to do science around the idea, but it's it's you know like 
everything else, it, you know, it shouldn't be discounted offhand. Yes? Sure. Um, the, the cases I was talking about, you know, they were deliberately injecting fluid. We had deliberately injected fluid in the KTB experiment. And so when we designed this experiment, you know, the issue of would we trigger an earthquake was very much in our mind. And the site that we selected was done both to optimize science and to think about public safety. Um, you know, we're drilling into a section of the fault that produces magnitude two earthquakes, which can't even be felt at the Earth's surface, surrounded by a section of the fault that's creeping all the time. So there's no accumulated energy there, right? You know, you, you get earthquakes because the, the fault is stuck and the plates are moving and the energy builds up and the fault has to slip, okay? But if the fault is slipping all the time, there's no energy build up for, you know, for potential release. So we, we fully recognize that, you know, maybe we might trigger one of these magnitude two earthquakes, but that fault is being subjected to stresses and perturbations that's far greater than the drilling process every time one of those earthquakes occur immediately adjacent to it. You know, a magnitude, like I said, a magnitude two earthquake can't even be felt at the Earth's surface. But if you've ever seen pictures of a mine in which a magnitude two earthquake has occurred, um, they, they, unfortunately, they kill a lot of people and the mines are completely trashed. You see rails that are bent and everything that's collapsed. And that's because when you're very close to the earthquake, the accelerations are very big, on the order of 10 Gs, okay? So these, these little magnitude two earthquakes, when they occur, they really, are stressing the surrounding, you know, uh, fault and potentially, you know, triggering earthquakes if the surrounding fault is ready to slip in its next earthquake. So it's not as if we're, you know, we're, we're drilling into this system and the, 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 the pinprick of the drill is going to be the first thing it sees. Um, these are highly perturbed systems which are constantly reacting to, to these other earthquakes. And, you know, should we, you know, um, trigger an earthquake, it, it would be the next magnitude two and, um, you know, like I said, no one will know what happened unless we tell them. We will. Okay. Yes. E e um, I didn't, you know, take the time to describe that, but after each of those 10 measurements are made, we're actually going to pump cement and seal those perforations off. Then after we drill those four multilaterals, we're going to seal up three of them, but we're going to leave the one that goes in the most interesting place into the fault open. And then we're going to put a, an inflatable packer down and isolate it and put the transducer near the bottom and measure the pore fluid pressure in that single zone. It would be nice to measure pressure in lots of different places, but experimentally that gets kind of difficult. The temperatures are high here, um, you know, and we, we just have to kind of try to do a simple experiment that has some chance of success. Yeah, we, we, we're actually kind of debating that right now. Um, for example, and one thing we're doing here during the, um, sorry about this, um, during the delay, of course, by putting seismometers in the bottom, we're, we're trying to take some of the uncertainty out of the exact location of these, right? We know where they are relative to each other, but we have to know where they are with respect to the drill bit. Right now, we're thinking about drilling toward the lower side of the patch and actually going through the seismogenic part, but which, which makes it relatively easy for us to core through the earthquake producing zone. Uh, and we, you know, we might do it a couple of times and then, you know, a couple of times come off into the creeping section, you know, um, which of course can just be out of plane, just, just over there, right? And each of these core holes is now, is planned for, to be 250 meters long. So we have lots of flexibility. And what we've, you know, what we show in the plan with those four, um, the four holes, uh, the four core holes shown is just very schematic and just to indicate that we're going to do it, but where we do it will be, um, you know, determined after a lot of discussion and a lot of consideration of the data that's obtained, mostly next summer. But that's not, you know, old, old evidence. 
Well, it, it's, well, you know, it's the active seismogenic trace. So it's been, act, you know, it may have been active for a long time, but, you know, it's, it's active today. It's producing earthquakes every two years. So it's, it'll be reflective of the conditions under which faulting occurs. those kinds of hypotheses. 
by you know, looking at the porosity, looking at the permeability, looking at the fluid pressures, obtaining the material so that we can study it in the lab. You know, the, the velocity dependence of friction you know, is now kind of characterized by you know, what's typically called rate and state friction. And it, it's definitely velocity dependent. And those kinds of experiments will be done on the cores we extract. And, and that will be incorporated into our knowledge of, of earthquake mechanics. It's also not a constant. The, the, the permeability depends from the pressure. And it was uh, also permeability of this layer of debris depends strongly on pressure. And we do get into account. I think it will be also. Um, in phase two of the program, uh, you will do a work to do continuous core. No, phase three. Phase, phase two, three. what we call phase two is the rotary delay. We'll have four spot cores. So, the most continuous coring phase. It's uh, 2007. We plan to orient. We, we've been talking about that. Um, it looks like it's almost impossible to do using any method except paleomagnetism. Paleomag is used now in the oil industry. And you use the viscous remnant magnetization to try to get a, a sense of, uh, of the orientation of the core. Now, it's not precise. It's you know, good to 10 or 20 degrees. But it, it, 10 or 20 degrees is still very, very helpful. And so right now, that's what we're talking about. Because any other mechanical system for actually orienting the core is, is fraught with, uh, with technical problems. How about, uh, correlation between the core and the image? Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be doing that. Um, and the problem is, um, you know, the cores are very short. And you, get it, you, know, you have to see just the right features. But we're, we're, we'll definitely be trying to use the image logs to orient the fractures and faults. That, absolutely. The most interesting part is the, is the active fault. If it is all bridging, how do you do the core in those bridges? Well, they, we're also looking at that. There are a variety of different coring systems which are optimized for fractured rock. There's a triple barreled core system that uh, has been used successfully in fractured rock in South Africa. And we're, we're kind of looking at that. And we hope to experiment with different systems next year. Um, this year, our second core was, both cores were in fractured granite, although we had drilled through some sedimentary rock as well. But um, yeah, we're on the, well, very intentionally, we're on the granite side. But uh, in one case, we cut three cores that were full of fractures, and they cored just fine. That was at 4,800 feet. Sorry for the English units. And at the bottom, at 10,000 feet, we cut one core in the fractured granite that was just fine. And the second core, we got into a very fractured zone, and that stopped the coring process. So the fractured rock is going to cause some, some problems coring. But the coring system that we're using for these multilaterals um, is the kind of coring that's done in the mining industry, where it's a very thin kerf, very high rotation speeds. And so it's, a, it's, kind, of, it's kind of like a, a dentist drill instead of a carpenter's drill. And you know, when you're having a cavity repaired, you know which one you want. Um, and so uh, we think we'll be more, we'll be more successful um, with that kind of coring system. But it, it's, it's going to be a challenge. There's no question about it. I mean, that's, you know, we, we all, what we're trying to work out is when we get these few centimeters of clay gouge and the 400 people who want it, uh, <laughs> how we're going to satisfy that need. And we, who knows, we might just have to drill another hole someday. During the earthquake? During the earthquake. Had, had a good run? Yeah. The, uh, at the time the earthquake occurred, we had put steel casing in the lower part of the hole, and we had cemented it. And um, we were in the process of lowering. After you cement the casing, you have to go in and sort of clean out the residual cement from the inside of the casing. Um, and so they were lowering the drill pipe in order to do that. So it's sort of a, you know, just sort of a technical cleanup thing, nothing very interesting. And the pipe was about a third of the way down. 
and they were lowering the pipe. And so the earthquake occurred and everything began to shake. The guys on the drill floor didn't even know it because the drill rig is kind of bouncing around and vibrating all the time. But the guy up in the derrick knew it, 195 feet off the ground. And um, two pieces of pipe, you know, the, there's a, things called the fingerboards and the pipe stands up and rests in these things. And uh, two pieces of pipe came loose and he grab and he, he's attached, you know, he's on this catwalk and he's attached with a rope. Um, and he got, grabbed them and he muscled them back and put them, and, and put them back where they belonged and nothing happened. Um, and so, um, you know, it's good to have a nice, strong, brave guy up there and nothing, nothing, nothing happened. And so, uh, actually, you know, the most dangerous thing that can happen around a drill rig is, is a piece of pipe comes out, kind of comes loose out of the derrick because then it comes shooting out and anything can happen. And so, in, in fact, you know, we knew the, you know, the potential for the earthquake. We'd taken a number of precautionary measures, but that was just something that, you know, had to be done right at the time that the earthquake occurred. And fortunately, it was.